start recording. It's okay. recording. Excellent. So, security. I, I've just uh, ripped them out of the uh, um, initial presentation and sort of brought them in here. So, we have a security team, right? And um, uh, there's some stuff about HackerOne. We have vulnerabilities, we have C mistakes, and, and we have CVs. Um, and we're a CNA now. So, I, I just wanted to highlight that it's fun that we're all. Almost the entire security team is here. Um, just Camille and Max, who aren't. I'm not sure how present Camille Duque is these days, but it doesn't matter. Um, just wanted to, we, we rarely mention who is actually on the security team, so I figured I could just do that. Um, the secret is out. The secret is out, exactly. So uh, I just uh, went through and, and checked what kind of. Uh, Activity we had on Hacker One basically 12 months back, and uh, so it says April because I did the check like a week ago or whatever. So we had 97 submissions in this period, and 11 of them were actual vulnerabilities. Um, the average time to first response is one hour, and it's sort of the, the, the medium time. So, yeah, there are some outliers, but we're usually pretty fast on responding to issues, and right about. 10% of them have seemed to be valid uh, recently. So I think it's fine. We medium time to triage is basically time until we verify them to be true, right, or not. <coughs> so we're pretty quick. So in total, we've had, I mentioned that before, we have 439 submissions in these, I think, five years roughly that we've been uh, having, having this uh, bug bounty attacker one. And so the less than 16% are actual vulnerabilities and uh, almost 20% are bugs in other ways. I think it's a pretty good ratio anyway. I mean, since we're sort of encouraging anyone to submit it and they, well, everyone wants money, so I think it's decent. It's not that much rubbish that, I mean, I would have actually have expected the rates to be worse than this. And overall, the, the medium time to first response, zero hours. Yeah, I think that <laughs> I like how they round it down to <laughs> integer hours, so that <laughs> zero <laughs> hours. <laughs> it's like immediately. Of course, it's not immediately, but it sounds like that. Uh, so uh, my, my impression, uh, and I kind of like, uh, I tend to say that uh, our bug bounty, I think, certainly works in that it encourages people to submit issues. and. 60% of them actually are vulnerabilities. And sure, we're handing out money, uh, but they seem to give us a lot of value. Uh, I'd like to compare it to the value spent on these audits that we've mentioned before. We've the, the, the audits that are, of course, sponsored, someone else is paying them, but they are very expensive and they rarely come up with any vulnerabilities at all. And we're paying much less and getting many, many, many more CVs uh, with, with the bug bounty. Anyway, so these are, uh, this is a graph showing the green ones are fixed vulnerabilities and <coughs> since we track every vulnerability when we inserted them, it's kind of just fun to see when we inserted the vulnerability and then we fixed them. So obviously we inserted them <laughs> before we fixed them. So it's not sort of, it's not a surprise that it's more red ones on the left and more green ones on the right. Uh, but it's, so it's, just a, a visualization and uh, filtering out high and uh, cr high and critical ones as red and the low and medium ones as green or a sort of weird green. Uh, you can see that yes, there's been a lot of vulnerabilities recently because people like to dig up stuff, but they're mostly just low and medium and not that many high uh, <coughs> issues actually. And one of the other things people like to uh, point out is that we're writing curling C, and C is dangerous and the memory unsafe. And, and um, my favorite fact, or factoid, I should call it, is everyone says that in C programs, uh, security flaws are like 60 or 70% are memory safety problems in the C program. And that seems to be a universal truth, even though there's actually that's actually not a number anyone a ever actually said. There's like 60%, I think, is said in a Microsoft report once, but it's limited to a certain set of flaws. 
it doesn't matter, but in, but in curve we're down to below 40% of the issues are actually sort of C mistakes. Um, and of course that has been falling for a while, so it was actually quite a lot for a while. Is this the right graph? C mistake? Uh, no, it's not the right graph. You're right. You're, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the wrong. Sorry, I'm, I'm messing up my facts. These are actually so the, the the black one here is actually the rate, the the ones that are share of all flaws that are high or critical. Basically, just showing that the, out of the total ones, there are not that many high or critical anymore. We're getting a lot of low and medium reported ones. The green. And Uh, so yeah, and the, this uh, this shows the age of uh, vulnerabilities once reported, right? How many days they existed in code when we fixed them? The the dotted one is age of the project, so you can see sort of uh, the gap there is how long until we inserted it, and then it existed for many thousands of days until we fixed it, and the average time they existed, and the medium time, and uh, also so so we can see that by uh, any any flaw existed on average or in medium many many years until we got them reported. I think the medium median time is seven years or something. So basically, we don't know until seven years ha have passed that we actually didn't deserve the bug. Mm -hmm. Do we or have reported time? Like we know about it? Well, uh, right, but we we. The, the time from report until we release is always, always short anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. within the release cycle. Right. So we never let it slide. Yeah. We only ever, uh, once we let it slide out of 155. So, so basically, long embargo, yeah. so I have another graph, but, but I don't think I have it here because it's not that interesting. Because then the time from report to release is basically when in the release cycle they report it. Because we usually wait until the release time anyway. So it yeah, differs between 0 and 56 days, basically. I, I just, th this is just interesting because it keep it shows that we keep getting reports like these not too long ago up here 8,000 days so yes security is hard and uh, things can suddenly linger for extremely long periods of time and I like these okay, so when you touch th so this existed from the beginning and, it's <laughs> and it took it took yeah over 8,000 days until someone realized oh wait, wait a minute this is not good. And uh, we can see there many many of these bars are close to the beginning of the project. So pretty much they've been there for a very long time. And of course then uh, naturally this graph number of vulnerabilities per thousand lines of code. Uh, naturally that will gradually fall by right? this. We have fixed everything now, so it has to be down to zero. And it takes a while until we find stuff so it gets reported back in time. So basically we don't know until basically seven years back in time. That's the medium time things exist uh, until um, until reported. So it's basically maybe we are at that point. That maybe we were so I think we're in general better than we were in the past, but who knows? Uh, I, I think I still think uh, one of the highlights out of everything is that we only have three severity high vulnerabilities during the last five years. So even if we can see, sure, a lot of vulnerabilities, but only three that were high or worse. None of them actually were worse. So yeah, I think it's pretty decent. Yeah, the NVD ratings, right? NVD. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh and and, uh, and someone mentioned yesterday that it's been weirdly silent on HackerOne recently, right? Yeah, 51 well. days until the last uh, confirmed reported vulnerability in Curve, and it's, it still remains. It's 51 days. Oh, well, they must have heard me say that because we got a hacker one report last night, right? Yeah, two. Two. Yeah. <laughs> that, but I think none of them are actually yeah. valid. So I think, I think uh, it could be 52 tomorrow. Uh, so, yep. I, I don't. I don't think that actually says anything. It sort of comes and goes. Suddenly, someone. Uh, very skilled gets involved and then suddenly they can dig up a lot of things. You know, when Harry exactly. gets another drive, he'll find yeah. another set. Yeah. So what's what's not shown in this is that 
we have a single person who found half of them. But Harry is on vacation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 I think he's that occupied with other stuff. Yeah. We're distracting him. Go, look over there. <laughs> <laughs> and then 51. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we had 20 CVs since roughly the, this time last period. I, I picked March 20, 2023 yeah. as a date because we need to release them. So that picked everything after that. Uh, right, latest March 14. And of course, I, I told you all about it. We got a lot of bogus CVEs. Um, uh, got a lot of uh, interesting attention on those, which is fun. Um, and I think there there is one, I, I think we were actually also among one of the first who ever actually got the, the CVE rejected eventually by MITRE themselves. We Even are, though it's completely, it's against the policy. Yeah. That's not how it works, but they did it anyway, eventually. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. <laughs> uh, even though we have a few other bogus ones that they don't reject, so yeah. Um, and uh, I keep uh, driving that fight. And we nowadays we have all the CVE data as JSON objects and, and provide, uh, provide them machine readable using this OSV scheme, which I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, might help somehow. Uh, and it was fun. And so and just now we're a CNA, so we're a numbering authority for CVs ourselves, which <coughs> makes uh, us able to reject it. Theoretically, we should now be able to reject uh, and avoid bogus CVs going forward. We haven't seen any of those yet, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that works in the future, but that's how it's supposed to work. And just to add the charter, like the root CNA has now said that they've completely devolved um, control to CNAs for arbitration of anything, so they're never going to get involved again. Right. In theory, yeah, in theory. So yeah, so I think there's there's development going in the right direction, and and speaking on NVD then, so NVD has more or less abdicated from their role as well. So and I think that's right now a, sort of a chaos in the system since everyone has been depending on the scores that NVD has set on on CVEs, and now they're uh, overloaded and behind, and people are all confused. What do we do? What do we do when we don't get scores by NVD? So it, it's all up in. in some weird state now. Um, we, of course, don't even set CVS as scores on our vulnerabilities, so we only set these low, medium, high, and critical. And, and that's tough enough. <coughs> and uh, I, I mentioned that briefly, but that we're not part of this open source CNA users group. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is going to do. It's run by people at Red Hat. Maybe, maybe it'll give us a little bit more um, focus. I, I think it's good that there are other open source, primary open source vendor that sort of have common interests and common problems. So maybe it'll help us give some a little stronger voice within that uh, strange community. And the number of CNAs is now I think it's close to four hundred now, and it's sort of it's just accelerating. It's going to be crazy amount of CNAs because everyone has realized that, that this is the only way to combat this problem. So everyone wants to be CNA and at least short term that because it's the only solution. It's, it's hardly scalable and it's a silly thing, but it's the reality. So yeah, we write a C code, right? So we do C mistakes and uh, I, I've gone through every CVE that we have and checked, do I think this is a C mistake? As in, is it a mistake, one of these mistakes? Uh, w could it have been mitigated or would it have been mitigated if we had used another language? And I mean, I don't mean any specific language, just may maybe not another, another language than C, possibly uh, a memory safe one, where these mistakes are less likely to happen. Um, and, then I, and then I marked the, the issue like that. So if anyone ever want to see, you can just go to the, even the JSON output actually shows what kind of C mistake, if any, that I have determined that they are or aren't. Uh, and there are now less than 40% of all the vulnerabilities, and uh, I'll show you the graph that I thought I was showing before. Uh, and of course, 
over over time, and I, in particular the last few three four years, we have a bunch of mitigations to help us reduce C mistakes, because it's obvious looking at C mistakes we did at least maybe three four five years ago they have followed, but. I think I think a challenge, of course, is to see patterns in mistakes because it seems that al al almost always when we get a vulnerability, it's like, oh, this is a unique problem that we were just stupid enough for this time. But it's really hard to see patterns. And but there have been a few patterns, I, I think, at least when it comes to the C mistakes and some things we can do to make it less likely or ha to introduce them similar again or make it harder at least to make the s such mistakes. One of them is that we nowadays pretty much limit every yeah, input sure. stream to eight megabytes, yeah. which some may sound stupid, but it bas basically <laughs> makes it us able to multiply the string length by many factors without them reaching 32 bits maximum. So, you know, and that might sound stupid, but we do that on many <laughs> places. And now it's much harder to actually reach an integral flow. I mean, we should ob obviously check integral flows better than that, but it's at least this is at least one precaution that makes it much harder to actually reach one of those code points. Um, and we're now using, we have a pretty elaborate set of functions to use instead of doing string and mem, that's a mouthful to pronounce, right? String copy, string copy, and mem copy. So we have, uh, in particular, the bin buff uh, functions and so on. So we do a lot more dynamic buffering using functions instead of these direct functions. Sounds a little bit like uh, hand-holding, but it actually helps us to use direct functions for, for these and it makes it uh, harder to do mistakes. And similarly then we don't uh, av avoid using direct memory allocations for the same reasons and they could go hand in hand a little bit. Uh, <coughs> and by doing this it's also, it also gives me the opportunity to make another graph, right? Because then I can count these <laughs> number of lines of code. And of course, uh, the regular stuff, <laughs> analyzers, more than yeah. <coughs> So this, the, this is the graph I thought I was showing just a, sec a few seconds ago. So the, the, the red graph here, the red plot, is the share of C mistakes out of all reports. So you can see it's sort of went down and up and it's down again, which is weird. But I guess it depends on our mistakes and what people have been paying attention to. But it's been falling for now for several years, so it's falling and falling and falling, because nowadays when people find problems in curl, they are rarely C mistakes. They're usually just stupid logic mistakes that would have happened no matter which language we did use. Which I think I think it's good. It, it, I think it might be a sign that some of the mitigations might work. And this is the, the graph then that I talked about. This then just counts the number of those functions per, how many lines of code per each instance of these functions. So basically one, we want the graph to <coughs> climb and climb and climb so that we have more code, or fewer instances of these functions per line of code. Basically it just shows that we avoid these <laughs> functions that are like often involved when we do C mistakes. I mean, per definition, they're one by one, they're actually not hard to use, but they're often involved when we have done C mistakes in the past. So maybe they will help to mitigate C problems going forward. Uh, I guess we'll know in about seven years or so if it's actually better or worse. <laughs> And wh what is good by, by doing this, um, w one thing I like with having the graph here is not just to be able to show you this, but to actually monitor how this actually goes going forward, because it means when we're dipping here, someone introduced new functions that maybe we should not. And I actually discovered this the other day, and I have a PR pending, exactly, it's because I noticed that there was a dip here. Why is there a dip? Who, who did what? <laughs> and I discovered a bunch of new mem copies that we should really shouldn't have in there. So so that's, uh, that's one of the ways <laughs> I actually <laughs> personally use my own graphs, actually monitor the development and think, wait a minute, what's happening here? So, so some lessons from the past vulnerabilities then, as I, as I said, it's really hard to draw conclusions. I guess you all 
looked at the vulnerabilities more than once and s thought about it. What, do, what did we do wrong here that made this possible to get introduced? Yeah, we had a missing test case, but, but can it, every time there's a lack of test case, right? So what, what, what's the pattern behind the mistake? And it's so hard. And it's also very hard because whatever we do, it's really hard to say if it has any effect because they exist for so long anyway. Seven years as a medium time. So maybe, yeah, sure, maybe in seven, 10 years, we can actually tell if our mitigations were good or not. Uh, of course, we can't wait. We just have to also speculate or try anyway. Of course, fuzzing is the best way to find flaws, or maybe it was the best way. Nowadays, maybe we find a little bit more. I used to say that when static code analyzers say zero defects, fuzzing has been sort of taken us further. But now I think it's maybe the other way around because where our fuzzing has pretty much plateaued, it's we don't find anything more. Nowadays, the analyzers find something, maybe every once in a while. So it's hard. Now we're sort of we're, we're at a hard point where it's hard to take us a, a big next step at least. And of course, fixing the particular vulnerabilities are usually, yeah, I mean, that's usually a, a straightforward thing. It's too hard. Uh, and of course, we're never done, especially because we keep adding, a, right, we added 20K new lines of code just the last year. So of course, we're not done. We're, we're likely to be adding new mistakes um, uh, every now and then, or at least we need to be. Uh, vigilant and, and keep checking stuff so that we don't have any mistakes. And I'll talk a little bit more about Rust in Perl uh, tomorrow because it's at least related. <coughs> so we paid almost, uh, well, $78,000 in, in bank bounties so far. So 25K USD just the last year. Uh, so yeah, it's good to have a sponsor that pays all these this money. And this uh, excludes the money that actually ends up in our pockets. <laughs> this is just money to the reporters. So, so we get uh, quite a lot of money as well, as, as I mentioned before. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I have a graph, of course. So nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it's the, the graph only starts 2018, when we started our first steps into bug bounty. I think the, the record amount, I'm not sure it's that visible on this. Uh, anyone, uh, anyway, I think it's this one, uh, fairly recent one, it's almost 5K for a high severity one. Uh, <coughs> the socket, SOX 5 thing from last oh. year. So anyway, I just wanted to bring up the XC thing then, of course, because everyone is talking about that. So. We worked a little bit on, on getting the tarballs reproducible. Lots of work from Victor. Uh, and now they at least uh, are reproducible, so you can. And now I've sort of switched to doing the releases with the Docker image. So now it should be quite easy for anyone else to just reproduce the exact image uh, as I produce when I do a release. I'm not sure anyone is actually going to do that or care about it, but at least sort of we helped anyone who wants to to do it, if anyone cares. Um, uh, <coughs> right, there we could possibly sign push for more sign commits. We have a 75% or something that I, of commits that are signed. I'm not convinced it matters so much. I think one of the pr one, one of the problems that people sort of ignore when it comes to the XZ problem is that he was a trusted maintainer. Everyone here is a trusted maintainer. How <coughs> do we actually pr pr sort of prevent that any one of us does something horrible one day? We can't. It, it, it doesn't matter if we sign our commits. They will be horrible anyway. And when you're talking sign commits, you're talking like PGP or yes. SSH signing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking PGP signing. So therefore, that's why that's what I'm saying. That I'm not sure signing commits will help well, against a lot of things. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I agree with you, but I mean, let's say um, you don't sign commits, um, and then someone takes over your account, and then and then you know, it, it's uh, signing.
Mm-hmm. For me, it's, it doesn't just uh, about non repudiation. It's about uh, you know making sure you know someone we do trust doesn't get um, taken over. Uh, and, and yeah, you're right. Uh, if someone has some, um, signed the commits and, and somebody doesn't, yes, that's true. Mm, okay. So if someone would get into account but wouldn't have the key, Take you couldn't sign. Yeah. Even better would be then double signing, or? Better, but... I think, you know, from, I, I think signing commits is a good sort of next step of maturity for a variety of reasons. It doesn't fully solve a lot of the problems, but mm-hmm. it helps. Yeah, the, uh, the question is if anyone would detect if commits are not signed. What do you mean? You mean you would have the policy that every you would just say you just signed. switch it on and say you get to sign your commits. And yeah, but uh, I'm saying that I have committed lots of commits in the past without signing them. How yeah. many detected those? Yeah, I can't. Well, that's a problem that's not being solved by this. No, no, no. Uh, that, yeah, no, no. Yeah. It's uh, related to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, yeah. but, but uh, it basically means that if yes, if we reach a level when every committer signed their commits, we c- that would be easier to detect yeah. if if a commit would be done without. In, in, in terms of what happened with XZ, I don't think that uh, commit signing would have made any difference yeah, because, no, because yeah. it no, was no, a no, trusted no. maintainer. Mm-hmm. Had they signed, that one would have signed them. Yeah. And right. problem not solved. And they, they helped out for two years before they go evil in year three. And uh, anyone could go crazy, or anyone could be, you know, they've got their family, you know, yeah. in the back room, or whatever. Uh, you know, any, anything can happen to the yeah. th- right. So exactly. So there's actually no decent way at all to predict yeah. against exit, other than reviewing people's stuff. So that even I mean, other reviewing other maintainers' stuff as well, even if they push them. But reproducible tables, on the other hand, that's yeah. Yeah, that's one way to detect it, right? Yeah. So that would have detected this stuff too, yeah. right? because you couldn't reproduce that. Exactly. It gets funny when people argue that open source is vulnerable here and the other <laughs> products <laughs> are somehow <laughs> better. Uh-huh. Right, but that's just silly. But uh, yeah. Exactly, right? But that argument is being made, of yeah, course. Yeah, and I, I also, I'm, I'm, there's also this argument that we were so lucky by de- uh, that we detected this time because um, yeah. the last guy found it. Yeah. But I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not at all convinced about that. I think we would have found it anyway. Someone else would have found it. Maybe not immediately, but I mean, it's just look at, no one has ever been able to actually land this kind of, pretty much never landed this kind of uh, backdoor before. There's a reason. Be no I mean, yeah. it's really, really <laughs> hard to actually <laughs> ship it all yeah. the way. So yeah, Andreas was lucky to find it this early this time, but hadn't he done it? Someone else would have found it along the way. I'm pretty convinced. And it got stopped before it turned into an LTS Fedora 40 or 2404 for Ubuntu. It's only happened in unstable and stuff, and then they found it before it was too late. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't <laughs> matter. I think, I mean, sure, you can you can argue how how bad, if he hadn't detected it, how bad would it have turned if it, yeah, maybe it worse, of course, if we had found it later. But I think chances are we would have found it later. Someone would have found it later in some other step along the way because that's what we typically do all the time right it's very rare that anyone actually can land a back door in code and get it shipped and <coughs> yeah. and uh, part of it also relied on, <coughs> on embedding like shady stuff in, in binary f- coded files yeah. and, uh, code doesn't have that right that, uh, right in, in that aspect xz was the perfect target yeah and yeah. it was in that case an amazingly well selected target so uh, of mm-hmm. course not a coincidence, but no. And yes, sure, you shouldn't have that. That we don't have that. Well, there are a bunch of base sixty four coded binaries in the test suite. Yeah, there are a few base yeah. sixty four oh. s- <coughs> things, but they're small and uh, inspectable. <laughs> are they are they reproducible? Like, can you generate them from source? Uh, yes, be- because uh, I think I think we could actually replace them. Because I later on I I, ins- I added a base sixty four instruction. So nowadays you can actually put it mm. the binary stuff and base sixty four binary test input or output for checking. Mm-hmm. Right, but 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 now you can just put the string and you can do yeah, it in yeah, both okay. ways. Mm. 
because when I s first in introduced the B64 stuff, I didn't have that at runtime, so I had to sort of encode it yeah. manually. So that's of course makes it a little bit strange because that is just a B64 blob. But they're they're not big, and, and we have these strange pen files. We have pen files. That's true. But yeah, yeah. they're certificates. Okay. Uh, yeah, you could probably smuggle stuff in a pen file. You can. I mean, it's just a binary blob. Yeah. Yeah. We generate those from config files. So like we could have a test step to generate the pen files. Yes. From config files. Yes. Yeah, we do that for the pi test, but not for the auto test. So that's at least avoidable. Yeah, we could. We could. We could. That, that would uh, remove that. Yeah, we, we, could, we could move it. Sorry, no. uh, do we have any secrets with the CI right now that we can no. inject stuff? No. So there's no no passwords or secrets anywhere. Yeah, and, uh, so we don't send any environment variables uh, with the CI. No. Okay. Well, we set the environment variables, but no secrets. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, I, I'm just thinking that if we can take stuff out of the repo and make it dynamic um, or generate it. Yes, stuff that we can generate shouldn't be the repo anyway. So, uh, I guess uh, I guess one reason would be that the tooling required to generate them. Mm. So because sometimes it's easier to just have them generated if the tooling is not present everywhere. But in general, we shouldn't have generated stuff in Git, right? Uh, and uh, and th that also then comes back to the generate tarballs question. <coughs> People, especially since the XLE movement started to hammering about, is that the reason they had the problem? Uh, I don't think so either. But uh, again, that's reprodu if you can reproduce them and someone actually verifies, <coughs> then that's not an issue. But if no one is reproducing them or verify them, then sure, then you can insert stuff. Uh, th that's the primary reason I, I I started fiddling with that, and, and Victor helped me to complete it so that now we actually can do them reproducible. So now we yeah. everyone can verify them. In my, in my mind, I think rep uh, generating tarballs, uh, I mean, as um, com compared to just using the tarballs from GitHub directly, I think it still has a purpose because <laughs> at least a lot of legacy users will not have their order tools or CMake installed and they want to build the curl anyway. So generating configure and a few other things actually helps users. We have reduced the number of things that we generate in the tarball. So we have, there's not so much anymore that we actually generate. So we're going future uh, stuff will have much less things generated than we had in the past, but we still do the oil, oil make stuff. And we build the, the, for example, the help output for the curl command line is generated in, in the tarball. So that's one of the reasons. So, and one of the PR uh, or the discussion items from the other day, yesterday, the day before, uh, someone wants me to sign the GitHub tarballs. Um, I'm I'm hesitating to do that because I think it only adds confusion to what the release is. So far, it's been very easy to say that the signed tarballs that we upload, though that's the release. It's only one. Well, there's one tarball, and it exists in four different compression formats. They're all signed. That's the that's the release. Nothing else is the release. I think adding signing another tarball makes it m more vague. What's what's that tarball? It's not the release. It's a signed tarball of everything that was in Git at the time of the release. That is that is that the one that generated by by yes. GitHub itself? Yes. Mm -hmm. They should be signing off signing that off the service itself, right? That would make yeah, sense. Yeah, what kind of guarantee can Daniel give to the tarball? Yeah, but it's okay, but generated so by GitHub. I, so I agree. So so the, I wouldn't then sign the actual tarball they generate, but I can generate it with Git locally. And replace. And it becomes the exact same. So oh, okay. it would actually, oh. you, do, you do Git archive, blah, blah, blah. Ah, so and if you use the same path that GitHub does, it'll oh. be the, the identical okay. binary. So I don't, I don't actually sign their oh, okay. tarball. I would okay. generate the tarball mm. myself and sign it, but I would upload the signature. But it, uh, yeah. so that, it, there's nothing wrong in that activity, actually. I, I'm more concerned about the, the signals and w what are we, 
why are we signing a, a tarball from, from GitHub when we're saying that's not the release? Why do you want that? Si but, but then we have this discussion, well, I want that for acid release. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We had a hacker one report while you were speaking. Oh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it should have put it to zero. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I haven't read it that carefully. Right. Is it uh, is it applicable to talk about throw throw URL? Yeah, I have a I have a slides about that tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, so no, uh, this this was basically what I wanted to say about security. Um, oh, like that with the XC stuff. I agree with you, what you said that um, I think we'd find it. Someone else would find find this. I think part of the problem with XC is is sort of a germane to open source in general. A lot of these dramas you don't hear about in the commercial world. Yeah? Right. There is there is no incentive for them uh, to. And it, it's only if it happens, it's a mis it was a mistake that someone saw. In fact, the the, <coughs> the pressure for bad people to announce is also diminished for commercial because they <laughs> want to keep on doing the crime elsewhere. Um, uh, I, I think open source, we have to deal with this many uh, people and it's a big problem. And, and I think part of the problem is communications. Like, have you thought about, like, it, it's inevitable. Curl, let's hope it doesn't happen, but it, it's inevitable something bad might happen in Curl. And Absolutely. And, and, and I mean, stuff, bad stuff is happening, right? right. Vulnerabilities are yeah. certainly bad things but getting introduced. Well, we have, s I, I think a lot of things happen about how the communication about the thing, right? You know, if you get a hundred, you know, you get a hundred journalists trying to call you, have you actually thought through <laughs> like a, a, an emergency plan? Uh, I'm not saying that we should do it, but it, it might be good to talk to, uh, you know, we got plenty of example, uh, you know, people to talk to, like what happened, uh, like some sort of emergency plan, uh, you know, have one person talk about it from the project, that really like some sort of, I don't know, but maybe learn from the, the other teams that have gone through this, uh, you know, crazy pressure cook cooker. Yeah, I don't know, we don't have any such kind of, crisis plan. Yeah. It sounds a little bit like preparing for the unexpected. Well, it isn't, because I think a lot of we can, we, you know, we, over the past year, there's been five or six of an each team, from from my vantage point, have it's like they're learning how to do it the first, how to res do this the first time. And if they had talked to the previous team, and the previous team, and the okay. previous team, there might be some really quick plan that could be made up just by consulting people who have had the previous pain on this. I, I have a feeling there's, there's something to do with um, uh, communications. In other words, uh, make sure only one person is talking uh, from a project point of view. <coughs> you know, make sure you talk when you're ready to talk. It has to be, you know, I, but there's, I think there's a lot of learning. There's some analysis that can be done in a, 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 a some sort of crisis plan uh, might be worthwhile. Yes, be. but isn't, isn't one of the problems with with crisis like that is to understand the full width, the full scope of the problem early enough to understand that there is that level of magnitude. Well, I mean, it, in a lot, this is, uh, you know, this is incident response, uh, vulnerability yeah. management. Uh, we have IR at Red Hat, and they, they, we do this, you know, every, every couple of days something happens, and then something happens, and then, you know, it, it, and I think a mini IR response plan is, you know, Make sure you get enough analysis so you say something soon enough, um, so it's not just dead quiet and everyone's. Um, mm. uh, uh, but you don't say anything until you can say something, and that usually requires a sh like a like you know at Red Hat it it means building a team together um, uh, uh, and someone being the um, uh, uh, you know the the leader of that team and, and bringing together the analysis and research that has to happen waking up the engineers um, and then within 24 hours getting a page of information out to the media. Thanks, you know? mm -hmm. And I, and the open source project, it's so distributed, so non-organized, uh, it probably takes a week before something useful comes out of an open source project. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, not this one. If, if something like this scale of thing would happen mm. to 
to occur, someone would contact the security team, mm -hmm. either directly or one of us would do it ourselves. And I'm pretty sure we would discuss it within a reasonable amount of time. I mean, medium response time, zero hours. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in, my, in my perspective, I'm always prepared for this because I mean every every hacker one report that lands is a potential big problem. So I'm I'm sort of always prepared that we're mm -hmm. we're doing a security release in three days if, if it comes to that. So the communication is just uh, among us. Then is is this serious enough? Do you understand what they're talking about? What do you think about it? And I think if someone would contact us outside of hacker one, we could we would still deal with that roughly the same way within the team first what 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 is this what's the magnitude what do we think uh, i think it's bogus to you i don't or and so on and then go from there and th there's a difference between um you know something that's exploited and not yeah uh, uh and there's a different flavor of panic in terms of known exploited bad things are happening right now versus oh yeah, I, I, I'm sure, and I'm sure I, I, as we've never had that sort of that level of uh, uh, sort of level read in curl, so I can't say that sort of I completely understand the feeling of sitting there with that in, in your lap. Mm -hmm. But we have had serious security problems in curl. So I've sort of had that sensation at least, sort of when realizing what kind of mm -hmm crap we have shipped for a very long time mm -hmm. when people uh, have exploited and so on so <coughs> so I think I still think it's in the same ballpark as that even if it could be much more serious but I still think that the, the, mm -hmm. the answer to to what would we do with that if it happens we would just communicate within the current security team and, and go from there and exactly that is a crucial difference I mean the XZ guy was the principal XZ guy was a lone hacker. Exactly. He that had no team to talk with. And except for that fraud. Yeah. Basically. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and even so, even worse, right? The, basically the, the the hacker here that had was the maintainer, so yeah. <laughs> he didn't even have to talk to anyone. He could <coughs> skip whatever he wanted. So yeah. Having a team is pretty. I, I pretty that have having a group of people to talk with each other and help it, each other not to panic. Right, to begin and just analyze is a very, what, what very are good we thing. talking about? Understand what the what yeah. what is this? Is it bad? Is it good? What is, what is it? Yeah. I, 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 um, I think there are some discussions that happen. Uh, I don't know how much, but in the embargo main list. But that was one day before the actual release of the of the CD, right? The right. Andrea sent yeah. an email there on the open warming list, um, and then they, they they there was some discussion about uh, keeping it in Margaret for one day, right? So, but I don't know how how those discussions went, uh, if there were insights from that, and I think at the point when at at the point at which he contacted the main list, he already got almost all of the details, right? But that's one possibility, I guess. You can you can you can report this there, and it's going to be discussed privately for a certain amount of time, and people can prepare the fixes beforehand as well. And for XZ, that's that's why the fixes were done so so early, right? Um, the moment it was disclosed. The security folks from all the major releases had already prepared the fix and they started releasing it. I think XZ is a pretty good example of something <coughs> good happening. Yeah, I was, I was. I mean, we can pick examples of something bad happening. Uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, the Log 4J probably is the one that comes to mind in terms of a, a team that uh, wasn't prepared and, and then, you know, lots of bad things <laughs> happen. Because of that, but I think XC is a success. Uh, yeah, I yeah, agree yeah. in so many ways. XC is a success, yeah. and it also sh I think it also underscores why vulnerabilities are still the number one sort of sore point for us and many others because that's a real risk mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. The back door is a very slim risk. Mm -hmm. It's r yeah. so hard for anyone to actually land the back door the XC way or any other way. It's so difficult. So, sure, 
I mean, we can't rule it out that it ever will be attempted, but vulnerabilities happen. Yeah, what do you spend your energy on? Low probability events with high rewards <coughs> or, you know, uh, high probability events with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, less, less access, so, you know, yes. So let's not do log for j either. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. And I mean, <coughs> but I mean, we all do mistakes, right? So sometimes yeah. mistakes happen. Uh, it's not blaming the people or no, no, things. No, no, it's no, just no, sort no. of what can, <laughs> what can we learn? I've done my fair so share of mistakes. Yeah, I know yeah. that it can happen. Something that I would suggest, I guess, is to think beforehand at where do you stand regarding embargo? Because in the case of XC, uh, it was decided that it would be discussed under embargo, under embargo for only one day, um, given its criticality, and still some people criticize that. Like you, you do have people from this field that do not believe in, in embargoes in a way, right? Okay. They, they believe uh, letting everyone know as soon as possible it's better, and this these two sides they are. Uh, very polarized in a way because each side sees the other as something extremely bad, right? Yes. Keeping it in an embargo is extremely bad, and not doing it is extremely bad as well because then you're uh, letting the attacker know that they should mm -hmm. go rogue and uh, do as much damage as possible. Right, so there's no good answer, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the right, it's a matter of religion, basically. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yes. uh, I've got an answer to this. I mean, I think people mistake embargo or no embargo as a sort of moral question. You haven't told them. <coughs> but you have to arrange the work. You know, we uh, none of us have infinite resources. The reality is is that if we know about something, fixing it, the action of fixing it will take some time. Um, mm -hmm. And does it help us releasing that, uh, you know, if, we are, we, if we're committing the resources to fix it, um, you know, what's the difference between now versus three days? Nothing. Yeah, I I guess, but I guess if you're if you're in the embargoes or bad camp, you think those are three days the bad guys potentially got that someone could have patched slightly yeah, faster. Yeah, but you've given zero days to all the bad guys for all the uh, other patches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so we are doing embargoes. So I mean, I'm yeah. on the embargo side yeah, here. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, I mean, people are just sitting there waiting for these things to happen, and then they exploit them, um, and now they have AI to auto generate the code for them. So. You know, it's a. I I think it's. I, I think embargo is just the reality. It would be great if we could, didn't have it, um, but I don't, I can't see any way around it, and I think it's really irresponsible. So so the yeah so our our current policy is right. We're we're doing embargoes already since we notify Curl. Uh, so that, no, what's the the distros mailing list? Yeah. About a week, ten days before we release uh, yeah. vulnerabilities. So we already do it. I, 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 I very much appreciate that as like I'm one of the maintainers on the distro. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm saying is because w if something is too critical with such a big blast radius, uh, at that point you start, you might start questioning yourself. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm all in for embargoes even on XC case. I, I think embargoes are, are better. Um, but then you will, you will, you are gonna get people mostly people who are not on those lists. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, because we get that feedback as well, right? Because yeah. there are some that are not on those lists and they will sometimes get upset yeah. and sort of, oh, you knew about it the week before. And I understand that if it would be super critical, maybe we c that would be a reason to maybe shorten the embargo or maybe not, I don't know. I, I, think, <coughs> I think it also goes back to the same question about doing releases in different ways, sort of. It makes sense to stick to our guns, right? To our procedures. Do the releases like we used to do. Do take the days we need to to do have to do releases. Because if we rush it out, so oh, suddenly we need to do a new release this afternoon. That's when we do mistakes, right? It's better to yep. maybe sacrifice a day or two and make the release according to our <coughs> procedures and policies, so that we keep keep everything like we used to. That yeah. Much better. Less risk of doing mistakes, though. and um, uh, there's I, I, well, I know uh, I think open uh, yeah OpenSSL does it. I don't know if Curl is doing it, but there's always the option uh, of charging money and then 
you can say, look, if you pay for support, I can let you know about the embargo beforehand. Open SSL does that. Yeah, that, and that's what what I do as well. So I basically, um, I only pre-notify the distros mailing list and paying customers okay. if they have a need for it. So that's the I sort of that's my repeated mantra because, especially in times when we release vulnerability information, people start to realize that we have vulnerabilities every now and then, and then people come asking for it. So I think it's good, I, I sort of stick to that message, yeah. that if, if they can't be on the distro list, yeah, they can pay to get the information. That's and perfect, I understand yeah. that that mixes my roles that I say that I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the commercial side, but also there has to be some way to actually just limit everything. And then if, if they're paying, there's a contract somewhere yeah. that you could violate. So there's sort of at least Yep. some commitment and some promises and s at least a little bit more than just someone handing out an, an email address and could leak it to anyone in the world if they want to. Yeah, there are some embargoes going going on which are questionable. I mean, especially when it comes to these protocol vulnerabilities which we had with HTTP2. Uh, there was one a few couple of months ago and saw uh, another one just a couple Did a continuation three, three or four yeah. weeks ago, the yeah. continuation. So you could DOS servers pretty efficiently with yeah. that. And there was an embargo um, via MITRE coordinated this time somehow. I don't know exactly who was all involved. But as the Apache server, we were like um, told we could not apply a patch beforehand in anything. We had to release exactly on that one day and apply the patch at that one. And then it would was announced also on that day and that I mean uh, that protects the big people who can who are part of this uh, coordination effort and can patch all their cloud stacks. Yeah, and have a uh, private in infrastructure to and do it. everyone who is using the open source, they will have well best effort the patch available a day or two after that. Yeah. So they are exposed and. Yes, yeah, so it's suddenly it's a, a question bit, exactly mm. who is who's who mm. owns the embargo, right? And who <coughs> and it favors those who have a private uh, infrastructure to, yeah. to do the testing and prepare the patch. Yeah, exactly. So mm, I don't know. Yeah. I'm a little bit. I can understand the motivation behind this. And, and they're talking about embargoes. Then, so we have this exception, right? The, the current project. We have an exception in the on the on the distros mailing list now that they allow us to merge the fixes and still have them under embargo because according to them it's public if we have merged the fixes even though nobody knows that we actually fixed the security problem with the fix yeah. and now yeah. we can do it like that I think it's for low and moderates why not immediately announce yeah low right but what we don't announce the security fix until until the release and then but we have already merged it in git yeah well, well that's a way of oh. announcing it yeah, uh, maybe yeah. it's not. A, it, I mean, it's not obvious to anyone no, that we actually fix the security problem. Yeah, it gets tricky because uh, in theory, if I'm on that mailing list uh, and I see the announcement, I'm, I I am <coughs> not able to pull in the fix mm -hmm. because I am breaching the embargo. Sure, sure. What happens <laughs> if someone asks me <coughs> to do it? They comes up and they come up to me and say, "Hey, can you merge this into yeah. the package?" And then I know about the embargo. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. now, I, I I don't think I I'm not really concerned about this because again, they're low and moderate. But there is the issue, right? I, I'm not about to merge yeah. the yeah. fix. Mm -hmm. So I talked to someone at the Open SSF some months ago, and he said, <coughs> "Guarantee there are black hats looking at curl uh, git commits, uh, constantly looking for oh, yeah. issues like this, looking yeah. for fixes like that." And trying to right, but then. <laughs> Well, sure, but then could look at every commit, and mm -hmm. because every commit is a potential security problem, right? If yeah, we just make probably mistakes. there's teams, you know, out east doing exactly that. Yeah, and and <laughs> but again, reality in, in reality, basically, like, based on based on uh, experiences from uh, Hacker One reports <coughs> from the last few years, people are not really they they don't need or. It's a waste to review that manually. They run they run customized fussers on on curl code immediately because with customized fussers, that's how they find the flaws. That's basically how every, everyone finds flaws these days. At least the ones we've found recently, unless you're very much into the protocols like Harry, but he seems to be a little bit unique. 
almost everyone else is already doing their custom fuzzer things. And custom fuzzer is only because uh, they need to find fuzz things that we don't fuzz, <laughs> since we already found the things mm -hmm. we fuzz. Or they make a PhD and they have to write something. <laughs> that's been that's been pretty common as well. Like I'm writing a static analyzer for my PhD and I found this thing over here. And then they report it. Like we've seen a couple of those. Yeah, and exactly. Like yeah. We've seen a couple of those approaches as well. Where it's right. It's a research project and they are bound to sort of submit their findings. Yeah. Uh, as part of. But they often usually then sort of misses the target a bit. Oh yeah. Like uh, we have started to look at the integer overflows. We have That's a few of those. These yeah. are all integral flows. Mm, well, maybe, maybe not. It's often very accidental. Right. And and yeah, and, and there's also this I found these and they have to be security flaws because they have CWEs, like a null pointer dereference. Mm. Is that a security problem? <laughs> Could be. Maybe not. And on the other hand, there are some <coughs> VPN firewall products which are made of zombie software, which lead to vulnerabilities <coughs> all over the country, <laughs> which are, I mean, that's, that's a standard that, that's years behind what is current practice in open source. I mean, yes. we fix vulnerabilities and <coughs> someone is selling expensive software with a 12 euro curl in it so what can we do about that nothing i think yep and we're done for the day mm -hmm. only 15 minutes late mm -hmm. we can press the Wait. stop record i can't log in you have to log in I don't know. Or, or tell me your password. I think it's in here. It's very Oh, you can add up. Yeah. Extra applause. Uh, to make it. <laughs>